Japan has today surrendered. Let us thank God for this great deliverance. On the 15th of August 1945, Prime Minister Clement Attlee declared that Japan had surrendered and that the Second World War was finally over. Thousands poured onto the streets of Britain to celebrate the news. Today on a special Songs of Praise, we're here at the National Memorial Arboretum in Staffordshire to remember some of the really incredible stories of courage of those caught up in the conflict. I was quite amazed to find out that I had a father that was a hero. And I'm in Chichester to hear how a hymn sung by women in a Japanese prisoner of war camp inspired courage and hope. He heard this choir singing and he thought it was the angels. And we examine how the wounds of war can be healed as one family of British and Japanese heritage embarks on a journey of discovery to learn about their loved ones. He said he would like to read the Bible. They're really shocked that um, they find out that there was a Japanese Christian person. We also hope you'll find some inspiration in our music today, and we start with a hymn of thanksgiving. Next Saturday, the Queen and other members of the Royal Family will attend a series of special events to commemorate the 70th anniversary of VJ Day. It's estimated that more than 36 million people were victims of the war in the Far East and the Pacific. That's about half of all the casualties of the entire conflict. Some of the bloodiest fighting took place as World War II entered its closing stages and the Allied forces approached Japan. Facing defeat, the Japanese command unleashed a new and terrifying weapon. Kamikaze. In May 1945, in the Pacific Ocean off Japan, pilots set out on suicide missions, deliberately flying planes at ships of the advancing Allied fleet. Even against the best defense, the enemy sometimes gets through. One of the victims was George Hinkins, who was serving on board the aircraft carrier HMS Formidable. George's son David grew up here at Greenfield near Manchester in the shadow of this monument to the memory of those who died in the war. His name's there, George Hinkins. It must have meant a lot to you when you were a child living here to know that his name was there. Yeah, it did. It, it meant an awful lot. It meant, in, in a strange way, it meant that he was real. It's getting a bit windy, so we're going to have a chat. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you said that. You never met your father, did you? 
No, I didn't. He was killed five months after I was born. He was a uh, captain of a, a Bofer gun on one of the kamikaze planes had selected Formidable to crash into. And when he realised that the plane was going to hit, he sent the gun's crew away and carried on firing the gun himself. And it hit just underneath his gun emplacement and killed him and, of course, the pilot. And how did you feel when you, you found out what had happened? I was quite amazed to find out that I had a father that was, was a hero. Let's, let's, yeah, he, he was a hero. But at the same time, I, I missed him, definitely. I still do. Many years later, I met the guys whose lives my father had saved, and they were with their sons and grandsons, and it was a question of jealousy and bitterness, and, you know, why, is not, why can't my father be here? What, why does he have to die to save your lives? But then something happened which gave David the strength to overcome his feelings. One day I, I went to church and they started singing, Father God, I wonder how I managed to exist. I realised that even though I'd not got a father on this earth, that I'd got one uh, in heaven that was looking after me. And things just turned around from there? They did indeed, yeah. It was just wondering whether the pilot had other family. Did, did he leave a son behind the, the same as myself? But let's face it, it was two brave men died that day. No matter which side they were on, there were, there were two brave men to do what they did. A story there of how faith helped David Hinkins find forgiveness. And we'll join David later as he receives some unexpected and revealing news about the kamikaze pilot who killed his father. First, though, let's hear a hymn of hope for those who face peril on the sea.
There are more than 300 memorials set across 150 acres at the Arboretum. They include a section of the infamous Burma Railway built by Allied prisoners of war, 16,000 of whom died during its construction. This is the original lich gate from the notorious Changi jail in Singapore. In 1942, there were more than a quarter of a million Allied military personnel and civilians in internment camps in the Far East. And over 80,000 of them were women and children. Pam Rhodes has been to meet one of them. I was 12 and a half years old when I was captured. There was my grandmother, my mother, and uh, five children. Jane Elke spent four years of her childhood in Japanese prisoner of war camps. We were trying to escape Singapore and um, trying to get on a boat. And we eventually got on the Matahari and uh, the Japanese um, spotted us and boarded the um, ship and took us to um, uh, Muntok Pier. And then from there, we went from one camp to another. Of all the places you went to, what were the worst memories, the worst conditions, and how was it? It was uh, more starvation, and we never had any meat, hardly any, maybe a small piece between so many people. And um, the uh, vegetables that came were rotten, really big cucumbers that were yellow. but. We had to eat it, and the, we got some tapioca full of weevils, and the rice was full of weevils as well. And when you complain to the Japanese, they said that's meat that, with, you know, the worms. On returning home, Jane and her brother depicted life in captivity in these vivid drawings. Also in the camps with Jane was Sheila Brown, who passed on her experiences to her daughter, Margie. Margie's mother told her the story of Margaret Drybra, an English missionary who was also interned with Jane in the camps. Faith was there from the word go. And it's faith, really, you know, prayers every night, saying prayers. I think that's what got us through, really. Margaret Drybra started a choir. And so then they were able to sing anthems and psalms. Margaret also composed hymns for the choir, one of which she called the Captive's Hymn. People were so moved by the words of the hymn that it very quickly became the camp hymn. And that was sung every Sunday throughout camp. When the choir was rehearsing in the kitchen, my brother was very ill in the hospital and suddenly he heard this choir singing. He was dying and he thought it was the angels singing and it sort of bucked him up mm. to hear them singing. It's getting me emotional. <laughs> Sorry. 